150 people online now between the panelists and the attendees and the number keeps going up. So uh, welcome back everyone to the public session of the Emsel Summer School. And uh, we have a couple more great presentations this afternoon before we finish up for the day. I think especially for those of us who have been in all of the sessions today, our heads are spinning a little bit with lots of information. But it's been super exciting and um, it's been fun seeing some of the pictures coming in that uh, Andrea has been posting on on our EMSL Twitter site. In fact, I wanted to share one that I thought was fun. We had one from Rebecca Prescott who told us that she was traveling from Scotland to her home in Hawaii when she got stuck in Florida on a horse farm. So she sent us a picture of herself hanging out with a horse and participating in the summer school. So um, <laughs> check out the Twitter verse and, um, and send us your pictures to Andrea if you wanna share with us. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly and have her introduce the afternoon speakers. Great, and I'll keep this short so we have max time, but I'm super excited about um, you guys being able to hear from both of these speakers. Uh, our first speaker, is Rekha Seishardi, and she is representing the JGI. Rekha does a lot of the stuff that we are actually doing this afternoon in terms of functional annotation and other things, um, and has a pretty impressive Google Scholar page herself. Uh, but what we've asked her to do is come here and speak on behalf of the JGI. And so we alluded to the role that JGI is playing in this WONDERS program in terms of these community sequencing projects. Um, but we also know a lot of you are early career, and so we thought you could really benefit from learning more about the DOE JGI capabilities directly from an expert. Um, and I can tell you myself and it's others on this in this panel who are also earlier in career can also tell you that they've really benefited from both JGI user um, support as well as EMSL support. So we really wanted to kind of end the day letting you know what kind of opportunities there are and uh, for someone who doesn't have to be a, a meta genome person. The other speaker um, is Dr. Owen Brody from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, and Owen Brody is gonna really teach us how we can take like his tools and how we can take kind of the annotations and what these genes are or aren't um, and how to scale those um, into a much more quantitative uh, framework. And I, I am myself am super excited to, to hear this talk. So um, both kind of using omics uh, in mo many of the tools that we use today, and you'll probably hear a lot of the same vocabulary um, but giving you different kinds of information. And so with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker. Uh, Rekha, it looks like your slides are up and you're ready to go. So do you wanna just take over? Great. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, um, so um, the Joint Genome Institute or JGI, everybody hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Okay, uh, so uh, the Joint Genome Institute is uh, similar to EMSL. It's a uh, Department of Energy user facility. And basically, user facilities are, are funded by the uh, Department of Energy Office of Science uh, to enable access to large-scale science and uh, advanced technologies and, and provide access to, to a worldwide community of users. So uh, the JGI itself was uh, established during the time of the Human Genome Project. They're actually responsible for three of the chromosomes uh, uh, as part of the human genome effort. And they were established in 1997 and uh, currently located on the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in, in Berkeley, California. And we have 280 employees. Um, so our mission is to serve as a genomics uh, focused user facility supporting DOE mission areas, uh, which is bioenergy, carbon cycling, and biogeochemistry. So I had some back and forth with Kelly and uh, I've sort of contracted and expanded this presentation. So this is what I, where I settled. Uh, I'm gonna provide uh, some information on uh, JGI's user capabilities, so our portfolio of products. And I have some within parentheses because I'm not gonna go all, over all of them. Uh, I just cherry picked some that I thought would be, uh, you know, most synergistic with, um, uh, with the topics that you guys are learning about in the summer school. Uh, uh, but there are definitely other capabilities and I have links provided so you can uh, check those out at your leisure. Um, and then uh, the second part is just 
talking about the user programs. And these are uh, basically program calls where you can um, send a white paper and um, propose to use those capabilities. So you get free access to all the capabilities, the sequence data, and some of the computational analysis uh, if you're approved, if you're an approved user. And then the third part of the talk is uh, a user interface uh, platform that we have for comparative genomics and comparative metagenomics called uh, Integrated Microbial Genome. So I'll touch upon that briefly. And if I have time, if I'm not going over, I might do this primer on annotation uh, since we've talked a lot uh, about, um, you know, KEG and um, uh, DRAM and, you know, all the different pipelines that are used to do functional annotation. So I'm going to attempt to get there, but uh, if not, uh, these slides will be made available to everybody. So you'll, you'll, you'll be able to sort of hopefully learn just from looking at the slides uh, later on. Okay, so capabilities, some of them. Um, so as I said, we, uh, we're here to serve sort of these DOE mandated mission areas. And serving those areas, uh, we're divided into five different programs. We have the, the microbial and the metagenomic program. We also have uh, a plant program, a fungal program, and probably the most recent addition in the last you know, five plus years is our DNA synthesis program. Um, and really what I want you to take home at the end of the day is that um, we are definitely known for our DNA sequencing and our advanced uh, DNA technologies, but uh, we do have a lot of capabilities beyond sequencing. And, um, you know, part of, the, part of the mission, the way I like to think about it is that um, it, uh, part of the um, um, uh, directive really is to constantly evaluate and benchmark uh, emerging technologies, which in our case has been sort of sequencing platforms, uh, the software that goes along with it for the computational analysis, uh, looking at other types of emerging technologies, and then passing on the access to those technologies and to the lessons learned and the know-how uh, to our worldwide community of users. So um, sequencing is our bread and butter. And um, I would say that we have two primary platforms. This is not to say that we haven't evaluated or do not have other sequencing platforms, but these are our two uh, primary platforms, which is the Illumina and the PacBio. Um, and um, you know, a significant amount of data is generated from primarily non-human uh, or environmental uh, samples that arise from, um, um, as I said, non-human environments. And each of these platforms um, is um, really applied to the products that, have, that are listed below each one. Um, so I think there was a question earlier on today about, uh, about long read technology and something about coverage. And I, you know, I just kind of briefly said that, um, so PacBio in particular, we use for generating uh, de novo genomes of both isolates, uh, of both uh, prokaryotic as well as fungal and uh, plant genomes and such. Uh, and sometimes it's used in combination with uh, Illumina-based um, sequencing. Uh, but we do have, you know, we use the Illumina primarily for resequencing, meta generation of metagenomes, metatranscriptomes, and our single cell sequencing. And the PacBio, on the other hand, is used for some of the products that are shown here. Uh, but as I said, uh, we have many products that go beyond uh, sort of the sequencing or these advanced sequencing products, uh, like the single cell. We also have um, um, uh, MethylSeq, DAPSeq. Um, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, go on about you know different acronyms that you may or may not have heard of, but. Uh, we have a lot of capabilities, and please visit uh, our product offerings page to see what all of those products are. Uh, but what I want to leave you with is that uh, we have also capabilities beyond sequencing, which is our DNA synthesis program, for example, uh, which allows you allows the user to synthesize genes or pathways. Uh, you know, if you're interested in functional characterization of genes and pathways, is very popular. Uh, with uh, biosynthetic gene clusters for secondary metabolites, for example. Uh, 
Uh, we also can synthesize combinatorial pathway libraries for metabolic engineering purposes. Um, and we have individual program calls uh, that allow you to use uh, some of these capabilities. Uh, we also have metabolomics. Uh, and I thought that I would touch on that briefly because I think it might be of interest to this audience. Um, um, okay, so moving forward. Um, um, I had some, sorry, I have some beeps happening. I hope my volume is still good. But um, I, so I just cherry picked uh, one or two uh, things to sort of focus on. And one of them is our uh, brand new project, which is uh, stable isotope probing metagenomics. And really the uh, idea here is allowing you, the user, to link uh, microbial identity to metabolic activity based on the uptake of isotope labeled substrates. So um, what the schematic is showing is that you would have uh, samples from the environment that are probably incubated or enriched under certain conditions. And uh, you provide then the isotope labeled substrates for its uptake. And the, active, the actively dividing members in that enrichment would then preferentially incorporate that label into its nucleic acid. And at this point, um, you would extract the DNA basically and send it to the JGI. And uh, we would take care of the, uh, the partitioning uh, of the fractions and doing the quality control. And then it would uh, run through our metagenomic sequencing pipeline. And um, as I said, this is a brand new project and we're anticipating that we'll be able to accommodate four projects per year. Uh, since it is brand new, um, I don't know if you can find any information through any of our program calls, but if you're interested in taking advantage of this opportunity and you want to learn more about the details or, or how about how to put together um, a study or study design, please contact uh, the two people that are responsible for bringing this particular uh, pipeline um, um, to fruition, and that's Rex Malmstrom and Emily Elo Fedrosh, and that their emails are provided, and they'd be very happy to uh, to talk to folks if they're interested in in taking advantage of this particular uh, capability. Um, as I mentioned, we have metabolomics, uh, and this is all under uh, uh, Trent Northern's uh, able hands, um, and. Uh, through the metabolomics program, you get gain access to LCMS, MS-based uh, metabolite profiling uh, in both targeted and untargeted analyses. And again, I've provided a link. Um, uh, so please check this out at your leisure. Um, uh, I'll talk about the user programs. In particular, we have a user program that um, allows you to use JGI's capabilities complementarily with EMSL's uh, user capabilities, and, and it's called the FICUS call, and we'll talk about that in a second. And what it allows you to do is sort of uh, submit one application to both user facilities and take advantage of the individual uh, capabilities in both location under one under one study. Okay, so um, you can gain access, as I said, to all these um, products, uh, some of the ones that I talked about, and an expanded, much more expanded set. Uh, that I didn't talk about uh, by submitting a letter of intent. Uh, generally, that letter of intent is really to check to see that the proposal that you submitted is, um, uh, is of DOE mission relevance. I mean, it's really a check to see that it falls, you know, you're not, it's not a study about, you know, human genomes or um, something like that, but it's of DOE mission relevance. Uh, and at that point, you're invited to submit uh, a, a white paper proposal. And then those white paper proposals then undergo uh, a peer review process uh, by the scientific user community. And so, um, again, I'm, I'm listing a subset of these particular uh, user programs. Uh, one of them is called the Large Scale Community Science Program. Um, and really, the emphasis here is on uh, large scale projects. Uh, we have a um, a cap of three terabases for Illumina sequencing and 100 GB for PAC bioSequencing under the auspices of this particular program per project. 
and um, um, all the capabilities are offered. So the things that I mentioned, the DNA synthesis, the metabolomics, uh, some of the advanced uh, epigenomics, all of those capabilities are offered through the large scale community science program. Uh, and as I said, you have those really large um, caps on data that you can that you can reach for. And these are some of the, the specific theme areas that we've been encouraging um, proposals to sort of focus on. Uh, so I'm not gonna read those out. Um, I'll just point you to this, and this sort of gives you an idea of um, sort of the success rate uh, um, of, of individual. And so the success rate for the large scale uh, community science program is 35%. So in terms of the proposals that are ultimately approved, um, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty good at 35%. Uh, the other program call that I wanted to highlight was the uh, new investigator call. And here the emphasis uh, is really to favor uh, first time investigators that have never had uh, a funded uh, proposal to the JGI before. So it really targets sort of early career uh, scientists and um, I guess the, the objective at the end of the day is, is sort of preliminary data generation. So you, it allows you to sort of uh, develop a pilot project and then you can use that information to then submit for a large scale uh, CSP. Um, however, unlike the large scale CSP, not all of the products are available under the new investigator call. It's limited to the sort of subset that I've shown before. So it still allows you to do the, the metagenomics, the metatranscriptomics, um, both for isolates, for, for microbiomes, uh, and also the DNA synthesis and metabolomics um, a product line is offered through the new investigator call. Uh, and then as I already mentioned, uh, we have a joint call called the JGI EMSOL FICUS call. And um, please check out our website and probably EMSOL's website for um, um, sort of timelines of you know, when proposals are being accepted and uh, when due dates are. But uh, this particular call gives you access to uh, capabilities at both facilities with just one application. And so I've listed, for example, uh, for EMSIL, we have high throughput proteomics, advanced imaging, and complex sample preparation. And at the JGI, it would be um, sequencing, DNA synthesis, and metabolomics with LCMS-MS. Uh, based methodology. Okay, so uh, one more about uh, JGI. I've uh, given you a link to um, sort of our, our user programs. Uh, you can explore all the different types of program calls that are out there. And um, uh, I also wanted to mention that, you know, any investigator um, is eligible regardless of their institution or national origin. So we do have a worldwide uh, community of, of users. Uh, all that we need is for it to be of BOE mission relevance. And if you have any questions about any of these uh, user programs, please contact Tanya Wojcicki. I have her email provided here below. She's serving as our interim deputy director for user programs and uh, she'll be very happy to chat with you um, uh, about any questions that you might have about submitting uh, a proposal to one of our user programs. Okay, so under the auspices of all these user programs, uh, JGI has generated a lot of data. Uh, and what you're seeing here is JGI's contributions to public databases. And you'll see that, you know, a significant piece of the pie, um, both in, in terms of plant genomes and uh, other types of microbial genomes are contributed by the JGI. Um, all of these data can be uh, accessed to dedicated uh, portals. So for example, for plant genomes, we have something called phytosome, uh, and we have microcosm for fungal genomes. And it's not just a repository for the sequence data, but it's also got uh, tools for comparative analysis. On the, on the prokaryotic side for uh, isolate genomes and metagenomes, we have something called IMG, uh, Integrated Microbial Genomes and Microbiomes. And um, I'm just going to uh, show you some of the um, um, 
uh, some of the, not the tools, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a large behemoth, so it's kind of hard to cover it all, but I just want to make you aware that uh, this tool uh, exists. And uh, it's a, a data management system uh, for comparative analysis of sequence data. So basically all of this JGI generated data uh, does end up in IMG. Um, so we have a dedicated assembly team, uh, you know, because we are a sort of um, high throughput, high uh, production type environment. We have um, hundreds and thousands of samples that need to be assembled and annotated. And um, all of those data get assembled and then uh, annotated through the IMG annotation pipeline. So um, uh, you'll see here, uh, you know, data sets that were generated by the JGI. Uh, for isolate genomes, we do go to GenBank and uh, periodically update uh, public isolate genomes um, uh, from GenBank or Ref, from RefSeq. Um, in terms of metagenomes, we have, uh, again, primarily JGI generated data, but we also have public metagenomes, uh, things from the Human Microbiome Project, for example, um, uh, and, and, some, and some other genomes. It's not everything that's in GenBank, but uh, there's still about 23,000 uh, metagenomic samples. And we also have uh, these other uncultivated entities, if you will, like the single particle so sorts, uh, cell enrichments, and metatranscriptomes. Okay, so there's a lot of data that you can um, look for, explore, and, and there are tools for comparative genomics. Uh, we conducted a webinar series re relatively recently, and so all of those videos are available if you're interested in, in checking out um, uh, what the possibilities are. Um, again, something that I wanted to highlight because we're talking, we're talking about uh, metagenome bins this morning uh, is um, for all publicly available samples, uh, the, um, for pop, uh, all publicly available metagenomic samples, the initiative is to provide sort of pre-computed uh, metagenomic bins. And this is the schematic that shows you uh, that, uh, you know, we run Metabat uh, to generate these bins. Uh, we do a certain amount of QC to remove uh, sort of offending uh, contigs uh, that don't fit uh, in that pre-computed uh, metagenome bin. And uh, we perform a check M based evaluation, just like you did. And only the high quality and the medium quality uh, metagenome bins are then loaded into IMG. And so at present, we have over 101,000 bins uh, that have been predicted from over 12,000 metagenomic samples. And uh, all of these bins can be uh, retrieved or explored uh, based on uh, their taxonomic affiliation, based on um, both an IMG-centric methodology, as well as your uh, genome taxonomy database that you used probably this morning, GTDBTK taxonomy, uh, or by their underlying um, environmental or ecosystem metadata. And then you can do sort of these cross, uh, cross metadata searches using a bin search tool. So um, here's just a screenshot of what it looks like. So uh, I'm showing a screenshot where I've sort of navigated down to um, 152 uh, metagenome scaffold bins assigned to the genus Nitrosopumulus under the Thaumarchiota. And you, know, you can uh, click on this number and it'll retrieve a list of all those uh, bins along with a lot of information about the content of those bins and the check M statistics. Uh, you can also uh, peruse the bins by their um, ecosystem classification. So in this particular example, I've uh, drilled down from terrestrial samples down to permafrost and it's telling me that there are 768 uh, bins uh, that have been called from, uh, from samples that are attributed to permafrost. And uh, as I mentioned, we have a webinar series. I have links to all of these in the, um, in the PDF um, document that I think you will be, either you, you already have or will receive shortly. Um, so check out the webinars and um, uh, maybe it'll be of, of some value. Um, okay, I, I don't know how I'm doing on time, guys. Uh, I'm gonna assume that I'm still good and I'm gonna soldier forward unless somebody tells me to stop. 
Uh, just um, about nine. Well, yeah, it's probably six or seven minutes if you want to leave a couple for questions. <laughs> okay. All right. So other than uh, JGI um, uh, sequence data, uh, we also encourage people to submit their own um, uh, metagenomic data. So whether it's sequenced by the JGI or not, we do accept submissions within IMG of um, external data. So you as an external submitter uh, might have assembled something in KBase, for example. You can submit those assemblies to the IMG annotation pipeline. Here are some details about what you would need in order to do that. And um, here's just a, um, a schematic of the IMG annotation pipeline. Uh, I don't want to delve into these details. Um, what it gives you on each side is the, this is the structural annotation pipeline. So it's the gene calling. Um, I think um, in the morning, people mentioned prodigal. Um, so um, this is the structural annotation pipeline where the open reading frames are called. Uh, we use two different um, gene calling methodologies. Um, uh, there's a standard operating protocol also that's available. And then this is the annotation pipeline. So it gives you an idea of the tools and the databases that are used to do the structural and the functional annotation. Um, and then all of that uh, content then gets uh, submitted um, um, to the, uh, the UI system. And um, it's then sort of uh, presented there in sort of a comparative context and in the context of various tools where you can do some comparative analysis. So here's, I guess, the, the primer part. Uh, I just wanted to briefly talk about structural and functional annotation. Um, uh, just to familiarize everybody, although you know, uh, you've learned this before, so I'm just gonna go over this quickly. So the purpose of structural annotation is to get at protein coding, at coding sequences, not just protein coding, it can be regulatory or RNA sequences, tRNAs. Um, so structural annotation really is just looking for um, the features of a gene. So looking for canonical starts and stops and looking for signatures or ribosomal binding sites. And calling these open reading frames uh, in, in, all, uh, in all six uh, directions, right? In all, in all six um, frames. And the ultimate purpose of structural annotation is to find the coding sequence theme. Um, uh, so structural annotation is not open reading frame finding, but it's the purpose is to find coding sequences. And in prokaryotic genomes, this is relatively straightforward. We, we decided to go with the longest open reading frame that's usually correct. Um, and you try to resolve any overlaps um, um, uh, in certain high GC genomes, this can be an issue, uh, but that's the purpose of structural annotation. But what, when people think about annotation, uh, they like to think about this part, which is functional annotation, where you're getting from sequence to um, um, an idea of the enzymatic function, uh, an idea of the underlying biology. And uh, so to do this, um, you search various types of databases and you look for similarity. And based on that similarity, you transitively assign a function. Um, and so there are many, many archives of databases and you've heard about a lot of them today. So I'm gonna skip this part. It's just talking about how you have bioinformatics curators around the world sitting around and trying to record information from publications in a structured way that can be represented in a database and that we can then use to do our comparisons. Uh, searching these databases, there are two general methods. One is everybody's favorite BLAST, which is called the pairwise method. And all that is, is you have two strings. Uh, in this case, it's amino acid sync sequences and you allow, you map these two strings uh, allowing for certain substitutions, a certain amount of insertions and deletions, and then you use kind of this best hit approach um, to parse like um, uh, the information, and then you transitively assign function based on that, and, and BLAST is an example of that. But there are many other tools uh, that are being developed as the size of databases grow, there's always a trade-off between sensitivity and speed. And so some of these other tools that you may or may not have heard of uh, try to uh, solve that problem. And uh, databases that you do pairwise searches against are obviously NCBI-NR. I'm sure everybody's been there one at one point to run a BLAST job against their NR database. 
So within IMG, we also have an IMG in our database that we do a pairwise search against. And as Dram already mentioned, uh, we also do a search against the um, keg orthology database. So here's a pathway map for that. The second method for looking for similarity is this HMM search that you heard about this morning. These are profile-based methods. And um, the difference between these is that uh, first, the curator uh, develops um, a really good alignment. So you take a, a, a bunch of reference sequences that are well characterized, uh, well known, generate a, a really good alignment, and then compute the statistical probability uh, for the amino acid in those positions in the seed consensus. And so here's, here's a schematic again. You have a multiple sequence alignment, and then you have the consensus, and you compute the statistical probability, and you build a profile um, such as a hidden Markov model or a position specific scoring model. And um, hopefully everyone can appreciate now that this is computationally a lot cheaper than having to do a blast search against the entire IMGNR database or an NCBNR database. Instead, all you're searching is these consensus models. And it also can be more sensitive than a pairwise alignment. So very frequently, you might not get a pairwise hit against an NR database, but you might get an HMM search result. Um, and so again, there are many different databases that are, that are, that are established and uh, updated uh, that are out there. And uh, here are some examples in addition to the ones you heard about in the context of RAM. Uh, so within IMG, we perform HMM searches against uh, NCBI's COGS database, the TigerFAM database, the PFAM database, and then more recently, we've added uh, uh, CAT FunFAM, SMART, and SuperFamily database. Okay. Um, you might ask, why do we have so many different databases? And, uh, and maybe somebody's already answered this question before. They are not all uh, perfectly overlapping. Um, they have individual strengths and uh, individual limitations, if you will. And uh, so there is a reason why uh, we try to maintain annotations, all of these different types of databases. And the reason for that is sort of maximize the opportunity to make uh, an inference. It's 423. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll wrap up. So um, all, all the data again gets uh, submitted to um, the IMG annotation pipeline. And on the, on the, on the UI side, uh, you have access to various tools that allow you to um, um, sort of uh, explore your data uh, and do some comparative analysis. I will leave with this slide um, uh, just to let you know, we have an annual user meeting. Obviously we didn't have one this year, uh, but I think we should be back. Well, we were all fingers crossed. We will be back on track next year. Uh, and that's an opportunity to, to hear about uh, exciting new projects uh, from our users uh, and from the scientific community at large uh, that use uh, sequencing based um, approaches. Uh, IMG has its own hands-on on-site work workshop that'll be here at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And we have a webinar series uh, that you're welcome to check out. There's a YouTube channel uh, that has, I think, eight, uh, eight videos posted there. Okay, I'm going to stop. I apologize if I went at a breakneck speed. Um, I'm assuming there'll be questions. Um, I don't know if we have time to take them now or I can try to answer them uh, via chat. So yeah, we can definitely, um, you can try to, you can look over the chat, but one of the key questions we can answer real quickly was, well, a couple were related to access for users. And so one you already answered very well in your presentation. One user asked before your slide about international users and if it was open to uh, non-US scientists. And so clearly the answer to that is yes. Um, another one asked about supporting projects funded by DOE agencies other than BER. So, for example, ERE, the Renewable Energy or Fossil Energy offices. And um, uh, if you could maybe give a little insight on that. Mm. Uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, perhaps I'm not the best person <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> Um, Tim, I don't know if you know more than I do. Well, I, I think, you know, and Nancy answered in, in the chat too, I think it's it's really an issue of, like you said, for the international or anybody else, as long as it's aligned with 
BER and DOE science missions. Um, that's really the that's really the the issue, right? So, you know, obviously, if it's not aligned with those missions, the answer is no. But if it is, it really doesn't matter so much who's funding the actual project as much as it is about the alignment. And I think that's also true for EMSL as well. So, um, and and obviously, uh, uh, thanks for you know pointing out the joint EMSL JGI call. That's I think been a really successful avenue for users to be able to access both facilities um, with one proposal. So 